I'm your host Al Fadi, and I uh, would like to uh, uh, invite you now to a brand new series that I like to title uh, Countering Islamic Arguments. And uh, in the last episode, I had my dear brother, Dr. David Wood, who is joining me here today. And we gave an introduction about the importance of us as believers in Christ, whether from a Christian background or a Muslim background like myself, to take those Islamic arguments seriously, even if we think they are silly or taken out of context from the Bible sometimes, or even arguments that are irrelevant to the topic, because there are Muslims out there that are sincere when it comes to searching for responses or searching for the truth. So it is our duty, biblically speaking, to be ready and be prepared to give an answer to all of these arguments that are being raised so that someone out there can hear how we are able to respond to it, which resources are you, we're using, and why it is important for believers also who are dealing with Muslims to pay attention to the way we are going to handle those arguments as well. And hopefully you'll discover that this series will be another tool in your toolbox. Dr. David, uh, thank you again for joining me. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, right now we have what's called the argument from literary excellence. And this is really the main argument of the Quran. We don't always hear Muslims using this argument much. If, 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 uh, if Christians out there have a, have a Muslim friend, they might not, have, uh, they, they might not ha have become familiar with this argument, but this is the main argument put forward by the Quran. In other words, if you read the Quran from beginning to end and say, what is the main argument that this gives me for why I should believe this? Um, then the argument is, is this argument. And we'll go ahead and read it from the Quran. Uh, there, okay. there, there, are, there are many passages on the Quran that deal with this. Uh, we'll read one example. This is from Surah 2, verse 23 of the Quran. Mm -hmm. Allah says, if you are in doubt as to that which we have revealed to our servant, so the servant here being Muhammad, then produce a chapter like it and call on your witnesses besides Allah if you are truthful. So notice, this is a challenge for unbelievers. This isn't talking to Muslims here. Uh, this is about us. Um, if you are in doubt as to what we have revealed to our servant. Now, I I'm in doubt. I'm in doubt about what Allah right. says he has revealed to Muhammad. I, I have my doubts. So Allah tells me what to do about my doubts. Produce a chapter like it. In other words, uh, here's the Quran. There are 114 chapters in the Quran that we have today. Um, produce a chapter like it. And so the question is, can we produce a chapter like it? And so the reasoning is, if you can't produce a chapter like it, then you're, you shouldn't doubt that it's the word of God. Now, even before we look at the Quran, that is a very, very strange argument. Absolutely. Right? If you cannot write something like this, then it's from God. That, that sort of reasoning. No, now, notice, I could do this with all kinds of things, right? I could say, if you can't write a play like Romeo and Juliet, then you have to admit that it, that William Shakespeare's plays are the inspired word of God. And he's a prophet and we should follow and him he's too. a prophet and we should do whatever, he, and, and therefore that Islam is false. Exactly, because he the, came after yeah, that. Yeah, because he would be a prophet after Muhammad. Correct. Now, people generally can't write. You might find someone who, who's a great writer and so on, but most of us can't write a play like Romeo and Juliet. I cannot write a play like Romeo and Juliet. The question is, what does that have to do with whether it's the word of God? I would say absolutely nothing. Even if no one on the planet, even if everyone on the planet tried to write something like Romeo and Juliet and failed, as far as I'm concerned, that would not tell me that it's the word of God. That would have nothing to do with what, that would only show that, that William Shakespeare had some sort of uh, unique literary style or something like Correct. this. You could say it with music. You could say, look, if you can't write a symphony like Mozart, then you have to admit that Mozart is a prophet and his symphonies are the inspired music of God. God doesn't just send texts, he sends music as well. And therefore, again, Islam would be false because you have another prophet after Muhammad. No Muslim would ever accept this. As, as anything but absurd. And yet, this is the argument that's offered in the Quran. Write something like this, or it's the word of God. Muslims would not accept that with anything apart from the Quran. And so we, we already see from the very beginning that uh, 
Muslims are very selective in how they would apply these arguments. The, that argument could be used about anything, and they won't. You, you could use that as, a, as in a rap battle or something like this. If Jay Z's lyrics are the best, and no one can ra write raps like Jay Z, Absolutely. he Absolutely. must be a prophet too. But Muslims would never accept that, and they would they would reject they would reject that argument from the beginning. And yet, that's their main argument in the Quran. Right. And here's something I want to add to what you're saying. Um, for instance. This could be used of the two of us. Your writing style is going to be different than mine. In mm -hmm. fact, one of the science in studying the Bible is to determine the authorship. And the authorship is determined with the style of writing, mm -hmm. phrases, structure. So this isn't something unique about the Quran. It existed even before the Quran came into existence. And the second thing is, the Quran makes the argument three times. One time, bring a, a surah like it or chapter like it, bring an ayah like it or a verse like it, or bring a, the whole Quran like it. Guess what? Today, someone did that. Actually, there's a website called suralikeit.com. Mm -hmm. You can always go there and see how many chapters this guy wrote in Arabic. So what? Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Yeah, and what's what's interesting here is, um, you can. You, and, and by the way, that there there have been people who've uh, you know like like the the book The True for Khan and stuff like this, where they'll actually read it to Muslims, and Muslims will go, "Thank you for reading the Quran to me." They can't tell the difference. That's right. right. They can't tell the difference. They don't even know that they're that that the Quran. That that's not the Quran, um, so it certainly sounds like it. But uh, when you are responding to the argument that Muslims are using, the response is no, but that's not as good. And so what we find is that Muslims are setting themselves up as the judges of this contest. But wait a minute, this is a this is a test for us, right? Correct. This is a test for us. It's a test. If we doubt, then produce something like it or reject the argument or something like this. This is the challenge that it presents for us, not for Muslims to tell us. Um, yeah, you, it's just not as good. The Quran's better than anything, and, and, and you've you've failed this test. But 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 in case people wonder uh, what we're talking about here, um, you, you've got the Quran, 114 chapters. Some of them are very long. Some of them are very short. Let's go ahead and read a chapter of the Quran so that we can see what we're talking about. Something that Allah says. No one can write anything like this. It's so amazing. No one can come up with anything like this. I'm going to read an entire chapter, one of the shorter ones. This is chapter 109 of the Quran. Allah says, Say, O unbelievers, I do not serve that which you serve, nor do you serve him whom I serve, nor am I going to serve that which you serve, nor are you going to serve him whom I serve. You shall have your religion, and I shall have my religion. Now, is that, is that the sort of thing you'd read and say, wow, that could only come from God. No one could ever write anything like this. And therefore, if you doubt that the Quran is the, is the word of God, uh, you, you're, you're obviously a deceiver because you have to be able to acknowledge that no one could write anything like this. Um, most people would write this and go, what, what is this? He's, he's saying the same thing over and just repeating himself and right. it's, it's awkwardly worded and so on. That's the response. I, and I would say almost, almost anyone, almost anyone, a, a six-year-old could write something like this. But the response from Muslims is, that's not really the Quran. You're just reading it in English. Mm -hmm. If you read it in Arabic, you'll see that it's so amazing that, you know, it just jumps out at you that this is the divine word of God. Now, by the way, uh, uh, there, even without going to the Arabic, you, you should already be able to see a problem there. Namely that, what is this chapter in English? It's, it's a series of words, one after another, arranged to convey some sort of message. Well, what is it in Arabic? It's a series of words arranged in a certain order to convey some sort of message. And that's sort of the problem with this argument. In order for this argument to work, you'd have to say a human being cannot put words in this order. But human beings can put words in any order, ladies and gentlemen. So it's very yeah. strange to say that you cannot put words in this order. How would you possibly defend that? But let's let's go ahead and give the benefit of the doubt here. And uh, Al Fadi, you, you you know your Arabic, so absolutely. I'm going to read it in Arabic right now for those who are interested in hearing it. قل يا أيها الكافرون لا أعبد ما تعبدون ولا أنتم عابدون ما أعبد ولا أنا عابد ما عبدتم ولا أنتم عابدون ما أعبد لكم دينكم ولي دين Right there, as an Arabic speaker, I can tell you I could have said it better than this. Wait, 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 wait. You're, you're not converting back to Islam after reading that, that, that marvelous not passage? Not even close. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the whole idea here is that Muhammad supposedly is arguing with the idolaters mm -hmm. in Mecca. 
And uh, he's telling him, I am not currently in the present time worshiping your gods and nor that you are worshiping my God, nor that I worship your God in the past, which is a lie, by the way, because Muhammad was praying towards Mecca for a while when the, they had the idols, idols set up, yeah. were there. And also, nor that you were worshiping my God, which is another lie because the Quran says that the idolaters in Mecca acknowledged Allah as mm -hmm. the supreme deity mm -hmm. in addition to those idols. But the thing is, the order here, starting with the present and moving to the past tense, is not the way you do it correctly. You start with the past tense. I did not worship your gods, nor that I am worshiping right now. And the second thing also, no need for this repetition that is unnecessary. And here's another thing. The purpose or the reason why this uh, chapter was revealed, according to, for instance, commentaries like Al-Tabari, for instance, or others like him, they will say, the Quraysh people came to Muhammad and say, hey, we'll make a deal, Muhammad. How about we worship your God one year? You worship our gods one year. We'll give you all the money you want or the woman you want. Muhammad says, let me check with my God and get back to you. But here's my problem with this, Dr. Wood. Surat Al-Ikhlas, chapter 112, was already revealed, supposedly, mm -hmm. where it says there is no God by Allah. Why didn't Muhammad respond and say, absolutely not? There is no God by Allah. But he had to wait for what? Yeah, I know. Th this is this is really amazing. I mean, if you walked up to me and said, Dave, uh, I'll give you a ton of money and a lot of women if you just deny Christ for a year. There's not going to be, oh, let me think, but let me pray on this, right? Exactly. That's what Muhammad says. <laughs> let me, let go, me pray about it. Let me go it. pray about this and, and think about this for a while. Uh, so it, it, you, you don't think that this is so amazing that it, it couldn't be written by a human being? I don't think so. In fact, if I didn't know the Quran, I would have looked at this and said, this is a strange way of even saying something like this. Mm -hmm. Besides, I'm sure you're familiar with this, that the Quran borrowed a lot of things from pre-Islamic mm -hmm. poems. Mm -hmm. This is a fact. Yeah. It's not like something new. So, one, we have that, that it's a very strange argument to begin with. Two, that when you read the Quran, certainly not, I, I'm, I've never been impressed by the Quran. There are lots of books I'm impressed by. Plato's Republic, I think, is an amazing book. Um, you know, in the Bible, go to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount or, um, you know, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, where the, the love chapter where Paul talks about love, things like that. Yeah. There's never, I've never seen anything in the Quran where I said, wow, that is so amazing. Uh, it must come from God. So it, it's a very strange argument. But then you, you've pointed out, even when you read it in Arabic, uh, it's awkwardly worded and so on. And by the way, we're, we're just talking about, you know, we're talking about the, sort of the style and how it's put together. When you combine the fact, combine that with the fact that it's it's completely disorganized, right? It's, 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 it's not in, right. in sequence, that it jumps around from topic to topic, that it's very confusing that you have to go outside of the Quran to even figure out exactly. which verses abrogate other verses and so on. So you can't just read the Quran and know what it's telling you to do. If one verse tells you there's no compulsion in religion, another verse tells you fight those who do not believe in Allah, you have to know which one was revealed last to see which one abrogates another. And so you have to go outside of the Quran to even figure out what it's saying. So there are all kinds of problems with this book and we're, we're told that only God could do something like this. So only God could, could you know, have this completely disorganized, weird book that's confusing, that you can't understand without going to outside sources, and which doesn't, which isn't impressive at all. What's interesting is even, even atheists who have spent their lives studying both the Bible and the Quran will make comparisons like this. Antony Flew was one of the leading uh, atheist skeptics of the 20th century. He eventually became a kind of theist, and he was asked, if he, if he thinks he'll ever convert to Christianity or Islam specifically, he said no. He's just going to you know, be a sort of generic theist. But he was asked, how, what, what would you say if you were to compare them, Christianity and Islam? And he offered a couple of comparisons, but one of them, he said, the Bible, regardless of your view, regardless of your theological background, is an amazing work of literature. Even atheists should read the Bible for, wow. because, of, because it is, it is, it's high literary quality. He said the, to read the Quran is a penance rather than a pleasure, right? Penance, for those of you who don't know, that's where you punish yourself for your sins. So he's saying that reading that you read the Quran to punish yourself for your sins. And this is an atheist who's saying this. this well, he became, a, he became a kind of theist, but that's the perspective he got, got at, when got he was an it. atheist, right? I'm reading the Bible, I can read the Bible, I understand the Bible and so on. Right. Uh, the Quran, oh my goodness, I, it's like punishing myself when I read this. And so that's what we find when, when, we, when we look at this argument. And again, this is the main argument of the Quran, and it's flawed on multiple levels. If it were, if it, if it were 
completely unsurpassable and we read it and we said, this is the most amazingly written book ever. Right. That wouldn't tell us that it's the word of God because it could just be a unique literary style that would tell us that Muhammad is a great writer. But apart from that, when we actually read it and find that it's, it's, it's not, it's flawed in so many different ways, then we say, why even offer the challenge at all? And all we conclude is that the main, the main argument of the Quran is, I'll be honest, one of the worst arguments I've ever seen for any position ever. And I'm a, philo I'm a philosopher, that's what I do. Pretty much all we do is examine arguments. We lay out the arguments, we look at the premises, we see, we examine the logic, uh, does the conclusion follow from the premises and so on, that's what, that's what we right. examine. And I, I, I'm not just saying that because I'm not a Muslim, I can look at arguments. Atheists have what they call the, the argument from evil, that if God exists, and he's all loving and all powerful. Why is there so much suffering in the world? That's not a stupid argument. You can see That's why right. someone would say That's that. That's right, exactly. Um, you can see when, when, you know, babies get cancer and stuff like this and have these disease. You can understand why someone would say, hey, well, why does God allow this sort of thing? That argument makes sense. Doesn't mean I agree with it at the end of the day, Correct. but I can see why someone would argue that. Uh, but when we turn to the argument from literary excellence, it's flawed in so many ways. You say, how can this be the foundation of Islamic apologetics? But it is. Absolutely. And... Uh, I'm, you know, we're, we're approaching basically the end of uh, uh, this episode. Um, one of the things that uh, really I want to just emphasize here, many times Muslim people actually knock down the ability of their God, knock down the ability of their Quran by saying that the Quran can only be read in Arabic. Right there, you took the power of the Quran and its inspiration. Mm -hmm. Because if the Quran is only powerful in one language and God made languages, created languages, mm -hmm. then what you're saying really the power of the inspiration is only visible in one language only. Yet, I read Arabic, I read English, I studied Greek, I studied Hebrew, and I know others who read the Bible in other languages. Never that I heard that I don't understand the Bible in French mm -hmm. or in Russian. No, everybody knows exactly yeah. what John 3.16 meant, what God has done for us, and they're all touched by the power of the Word of God. When Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, he didn't say in Greek only. Mm -hmm. No. He expected basically his disciples and expects us today to speak to people in a language that they would understand. Dr. Wood, tell us what should the audience expect next by way of counter arguments? Well, next we can go into another argument from the Quran, which uh, is, is based on the, the claim that the Quran contains no contradictions or discrepancies. And so okay. for Muslims who say, that this, the Quran must be the word of God because it contains no contradictions. We're going to examine that argument and see uh, how persuasive it is. Well, you've heard it. Hopefully you've enjoyed uh, this particular um, uh, episode and uh, look forward to our next one. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Mm -hmm.